Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Bengal Tiger Podcast. I'm Matthew Brune, and joining me once again is Shay Dixon. Shay, we can cut cut right to it. 55-49 loss for LSU to Ole Miss in Oxford uh, tonight, dropping them to three and two on the season, two and one in conference play. It was a game of historic proportions defensively, and I'm not talking good for either team. And yes, I said defensively and not offensively, because if you look at this from an offensive perspective, it is one of the um, biggest shootouts in, uh, you know, in SEC, at least recent SEC history. A uh, game that totaled over 1,300 yards, a game that went well over 100 points, 104 points. And uh, both teams had eight or more, or LSU had eight yards per play, Ole Miss had eight and a half yards per play. It was neither team getting a stop. It was both teams lining up the scoreboard. And at the end of the day, it was Ole Miss who defeats LSU. I think we have to start on that side of the ball, but what, where do you want to attack this game? I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do some big like dialogue here, or, you know, opening montage. The defense is not good at all. Uh, the, I don't know if you want, I don't care if you want to blame it on scheme Mm -hmm. position coaches, coordinator, players, defensive backfield, especially we've said all off season was not up to standard. It is actually now performing even worse than we anticipated. There is no, here's one thing I will start out by saying before we get into it. I don't want to hear any LSU fan out there say one thing about the offense or Den Brock's calls on the final drive or they even I can even get into the debate and I can hear both sides of going not going for it on fourth and seven. They take a delay a game. They punt yeah. Ole Miss scores in a minute. Well, they also punted, get them down to the 12 yard line, drives the whole field. Like that's not the offense. That's not the offense of play calling. You have to make a stop eventually. They couldn't. This is one of the worst defensive performances I've ever witnessed covering LSU football. They gave up over 700 yards. They gave up more than 50 points. They couldn't ever get a stop in any meaningful fashion, certainly not late. Yeah. I'm not trying to overreact to anything more than anyone who says an offense who puts up 637 yards and 49 points will had anything to do with the outcome of the game is asinine and they're caught up in the moment. LSU's yeah. offense is actually elite. It's one of the best in the country. Their defense to this point is awful. Yes. Um, I'll continue on the defense. Uh, I remember when I took this job and started covering this LSU team, I went back and watched the 2020 season, uh, obviously very closely. And obviously that was the where two of the first three games that year were Mississippi State and Missouri. And both of those games, LSU allowed about 600 yards. And I think back on that season a lot when I think of bad defense, and I think a lot of LSU fans do. And to this point in the year, obviously this being the – absolute worst lowest moment for this defense i knew that this that we were in trouble going into this game when i was watching AM and arkansas and arkansas not look clear not not look nearly as good as they did last week as they did against AM. and i said okay am i giving this lsu defense too much credit going into this game because i had it as what was it 42 27 um an lsu win here and i Watched Ole Miss play Tulane. I watched Ole Miss play Alabama. Obviously, we can look at the stats of LSU, of Ole Miss playing Georgia Tech, which even then was not very impressive on the offensive side of the ball in particular. And we've talked about the run game struggles. We talked about Judkins not being right. We talked about all these things. But when Ole Miss played LSU today, if you had no context of what this Ole Miss team was up to this point in the year, you would think that this was an offense – among the top five, top 10 in the country in every statistical category. And I went out and said, wrote multiple times that this Ole Miss team was not good because to this point in the year, before before kickoff at 5 p.m. Central time in Oxford, they had not been good. And lo and behold, we sit here five hours later and they just dropped 55 on LSU's head. And you're right. It can be a scheme issue. It can be a personnel issue. I'm siding more so on 
they yes, they are shorthanded personnel wise, obviously. Like defensive back, we talked about it. Um, defensive line is not is not performing at the level at which we need them to perform at, sure. But ultimately, I watched Tulane give Ole Miss all it could handle for about three quarters. Georgia Tech, even to a degree, had a better performance than this. And then I watched Alabama obviously shut down this offense. There's there's not that much of a talent difference here. It's guys running on guys running free. It's blown assignments. It's guys just not. Um, I I think a lot of it is is coaching to a degree. So it's something that's really interesting moving forward because this defense is we had we had red flags against Florida State and obviously against Arkansas, and now it's just the entire floor has just fallen out from underneath. There was a lot of I'll play the devil's advocate to the this argument. Not that it all in, it all ends in the same place. They're not good yeah. uh, on defense. Even when they're there to make plays, they don't. Like yeah. that's I will not defend Matt House. I'm not the defensive coordinator. I won't defend any. Co- if you want to blame coaches, I'm not going to defend you. If you want to say that the personnel is not good enough and not up to the standard, I'm not going to argue with you either on either of those things. I agree. But even when they are in position to make plays, they don't. And that falls down to, I think, back on there. I just don't think they're that good. They are, as someone said on the board, Florida State took a lot of transfers. They seem to be doing okay. They took better transfers than LSU did. LSU's transfers, certainly in the defensive backfield, are not up to the LSU standard. That is the bottom line, and nor is this coaching performance. Yes, and obviously something we've heard and we've talked about throughout the first three, four games of the season was why aren't they playing X, Y, Z, right? Not just freshmen, but across the board. Um, I don't think they have – now we saw them in this game. They started the game and played all Yeah, Welsh and Stamps. All their corners played. Welsh, Stamps, Alexander, Harris, all four of them played. And I think probably what, Alexander probably had the best game of the four. And we've already seen Chestnut play. Yeah, we've seen Chestnut and he was he didn't travel with the team for whatever reason. But like well, it doesn't matter. We've seen him play. He wasn't doing yes. anything to help them tonight. Exactly. So we've seen all five corners now. We've seen all the, the safeties that they can play. Ryan Yates is playing. Obviously, Javi and Toviano we haven't seen, but I I think we're we're safe in saying we've seen all of their corner or safety options. Sage Ryan included tonight a lot. Linebacker play, we've seen all of them with weeks. Um, basically all of them except Christian Brathway, who's obviously going to redshirt this year. Defensive line wise, I mean, you can't go much farther down the depth chart. They've played Parrish Shan a ton today. They played Jordan Jefferson a ton today. Mason Smith and Makai Wingo are what they are at this point. Savion Jones. Like, I they've played a ton of guys defensively. And so now it's like there's no more turning stones here. There's no more unlocking something. Brian Kelly said after the game, as far as the cornerback goes, cornerback position goes, nobody's walking through that door that's going to save us. And he's right. So now it's can they make plays? Can they scheme better? There's a lot of uncertainty here. And while they have, you know, Missouri, Auburn, Army as the next three games, cool, whatever, the goals for this team were always, obviously, to compete for an SEC West title. And at this moment, after watching, you know, Alabama and a and I think those are the top two teams. And now Ole Miss, which I'm going to put up there, too. I think those are three teams that you could argue are better than LSU at this point in the year. It's a fact. I mean, we said yeah. going into this week that A&M, Bama, and LSU were the best teams in the SEC West. Ole Miss beat LSU. And look, if you are had Chris Hilton come down with that catch at the end, Mm-hmm. Ole Miss fans are saying the exact same thing about Pete Golding tonight. How do you give up oh, yeah. 700 yards and 50 something points to somebody? Being on the losing, being on the winning end of it as an Ole Miss fan, you'll look past it. The reality is, even had LSU caught that ball and they moved to what three and zero in the SEC yeah, and four and one, or yeah, four and one on the they season. Right. And you got all this, everyone's excited, and you've now hit a walk-off for the second week in a row, and what a dramatic game. It doesn't change the fact that you're not good on defense. And any offense that – now, granted, Ole Miss's offense is good. I'm not, like, trying to sugarcoat this. They are one of the best offenses in the SEC. If you face a good offense, be prepared to score 
40 plus points because it, yeah LSU is just not good on defense they just aren't and nothing is going to change that this year I do not believe at all that anything is going to change the fact that if they run up against good offense that offense will put up points on them and and that's where I was most wrong looking at this game was Ole Miss to this point in the year like I said I just didn't think I thought something was was seriously wrong with them on the offensive line which again I still don't think they were great offensive line but then they were blowing LSU off the ball and you're like, where? And that goes to your point of it's, you know, coaching can only do so much. If you're getting blown off the ball, you're getting blown off the ball. And you end the game where I believe it was Ole Miss, yeah, ends with six and a half yards per rush. I mean, this is an offense that couldn't run the ball against anybody other than Mercer to this point in the year. And now you're getting six and a half yards per rush against LSU. So it's it's jarring because I agree with you in that personnel-wise and head coach-wise – this has the makings to be a good offense. And if they would have played week one, if this game was week one, I would be like, yeah, you know, it's two great offenses going back and forth. But we have context of Ole Miss to this point, not like struggling, legitimately struggling. And so that's what makes it so confounding is that LSU, like we, yeah, Florida State is a much better team. Arkansas at least, you know, showed pulses against like BYU and stuff. Ole Miss had not shown a pulse on offense. And now this is where their come their breakout party is against LSU, and it results in a win. And I, I said coming in, one of my biggest concerns of picking LSU to win this game was I think Lane Kiffin, the Lane Kiffin against Matt House matchup. And I don't want to make it only coach versus coach, but like Lane Kiffin was going to come into this game and unload the clip. This was a massive game for Ole Miss, and he coached like it. They played like it. The home crowd felt it. Ole Miss, I mean, deserved to win this game. And honestly – probably would have won this game on a walk-off field goal if the guy goes out of bounds at, at the one-yard line and still scores a touchdown uh, at the end of the game. I'm not going to say that – maybe I misheard. I think Ole Miss has had a pulse on offense this year. Not running the ball, they haven't. Okay. But Dart is thrown for – I mean, he threw for 250 on Bama. He threw for 250 on Georgia Tech. He threw for over 250 on Tulane threw for nearly 350 on Mercer. He's run the ball very well. Yes, they didn't play well against Bama, but it was J Judkins going for 33 and 177. The run game is, is, the, is the thing more than anything that was disheartening. 100%. That's the surprise to me. I knew LSU's defensive backfield wasn't any good. Yes. Judkins, I mean, I was even talking to some old Miss people, diehards right before the game, and they were saying, we think it's going to be close. It'll be a shootout. And when I asked, well, what do you think, you know, what is it going to come down to? They said, well, Dart, because Judkins doesn't have a pulse this year. Well, he literally ran over LSU the entire game and looked like he did as a true freshman. So I do, I honestly, I do not know if there are answers to be given right now, even switching up personnel, because people say, play the freshman. Okay, well, then they look like freshmen. Play the transfers. Well, they're not that great. Play and, this guy. Well, he doesn't solve every issue. And even schematically, they've they've gone from exactly. uh, they've gone from the four three to the, today they play a three three five with uh, Harold Perkins at the Jack position. And I thought Harold Perkins was the only real bright spot. I went weeks as well. Like those two were the only real bright spots to me defensively. But they've tried when they let Wit Weeks too. play. You know yeah. when they let Wit Weeks actually get in the game. Why exactly. he sat on the bench for a half? I have no idea. Exactly. So, I mean, they, I think they've even tried a lot of things schematically here. Um, ultimately, to your point, you have to make plays when you're in position and you have to get coached to make those plays in position. And I, it is jarring. Um, I saw some people talk about, and we won't spend too much longer on the defense. I do want to give a little shout to the offense, but I saw a lot of some people also mention like, man, you know, last year LSU's defense was at least, you know, solid and stuff. And it was, but it also had its fair share of, of concerns. And also we have to remember in the defensive backfield, I thought I, I mentioned this time after time, the defensive backs of last year did kind of mask some, a lot of the deficiencies that they had. And this year you're not getting any of that. I mean, how many, if Greg Brooks not being on this team, I would do want to say this Greg Brooks not being on this team, I think is a major hit to the secondary. Absolutely. And how many times, two things did we say in the off season one, they better hope and pray that they hit in the portal at corner like they did a year ago when Makai Garner and Jarrett Bernard Converse bailed them out. And they had Jay Ward and they could rotate him in. And those guys saved the season in that regard or it would have looked a lot like this. 
The other thing we said all offseason on this podcast, Matty B, on the Bengal Tiger, everywhere, it was no secret. This isn't a bold prediction. If Greg Brooks, and at the time, we were not thinking anything of Andre Sam, if Greg yeah. Brooks or Major Burns went down, they had nobody else back there. Greg Brooks is the better player. When he's unavailable for you, and now you're down to just Sam and Burns, and then you're having to bring in true freshmen like Ryan Yates, who made a big play, made a couple of big yeah. plays. But it just shows you don't have many options. And I've said this before. I called the DBs a multi-year rebuild. I thought that meant two years. It's beyond that. They're, in year two, there is no saving it right now. Where you go in year three, TBD, that's for another day. Yep. But in no world should you ever go over 600 yards on offense, hit nearly 50 points, and lose a football game. And that's yeah, what they did um, tonight. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, obviously, the last the last thing on defensively, I mean, people will, will say, you know, just go all young at this point. I, I don't know if that's feasible, but I think everything's on the table right now. Defensive back-wise, everything's there. Like I said, they've exhausted so many options uh, already through five games. I don't know what other stone, stone is left to turn. At this point, so that will be interesting to watch moving forward. Um, do we have an ad read before we move forward? We do. Uh, my perfect franchise, and this is a perfect ad read for today because maybe people are looking to uh, to get away from LSU football and maybe pick up a second job or just go into a new line of work. Kill time. There you go. It's the the perfect time for it. But uh, you guys know every week uh, in our uh, instant reaction prop podcast, we go with my perfect franchise, Andy Luduki, and the. Folks over there are uh, the best in the business. Um, and as Andy said, are you ready to leave the corporate rat race for the American dream? Looking for the side hustle while you work your current job or just looking to diversify, build wealth, leave a legacy? Andy can help. The main thing here with Andy is it's free, 100% to give him a call at 404-973-9901. Email him at andy at myperfectfranchise.net uh, or visit. Uh, myperfectfranchise.net uh, to check things out. Free to get involved. Andy has been great with us. He works at a ton of with a ton of on three sites, and is really just trying to help educate people more on what it means to be a franchise owner or um, get involved in a franchise in any way, uh, whether it's just sort of part time. But no matter your income, uh, how much money you're willing to put into it, all of those questions he can answer for you. He can walk you through it um, and let us know, LSU fans, if you are now bailing on the football team because you're very mad about one loss and you've now decided decided to uh go in the franchisee direction and uh and we wish you all the the best on your ventures but uh maddie b um okay let's talk about two things one the offense then an overall bigger picture to yes. wrap things up this offense is one of the best offenses in college football Jaden daniels is one of the most he's improved no doubt all off season throw the deep ball throw the deep ball He's putting it into the receiver's chest, the, the bread basket, whatever you call it, on every deep ball. And he's doing it every single week. One, let's just start there. Your reaction to the passing game that continues to actually just get better and better and better. Yeah, I, I was going to say, this, is pro this might be the best game of his career. And I thought the best game of his career was against Mississippi State. And so we have two of the best games. And obviously the second half against Arkansas, he was fantastic too. So you're looking at outside of a slow start against Arkansas, he's been absolutely terrific throughout basically the entire season. Uh, I don't even think he was that bad in the second half against Florida State. So um, the improvement is drastic. The composure to continuously score time after time after time when you know your defense was not going to give you any help. Uh, they were down double digits. They were down 14 twice in this game. Took the and lead. I was telling people, I was like, I told my friends, I was like, I might just take the live uh, spread here. Like, I think I think LSU is very live to win this game still. And sure enough, Daniels continued to march down the field, 414 yards, four tutties, uh, 27 to 36 passing. I mean, he is absolutely locked oh, in. And he ran it for 99 and one. Dude. <laughs> and they did the tush push. They did the... The Philadelphia Eagles special finally from the goal line, which was was great. That's that's where you start, in my opinion, uh, when you assess this game. Yeah, da Daniels is responsible for over 500 yards and five touchdowns, and he looked really, really good. I mean, he was a 75% completion percentage again. He's 
He's yeah. been excellent. I, I hate it for this offense as someone who just has to watch it and cover it, yep. that the defense doesn't come through for him because you should win every single game that your offense plays like that. Yeah. Uh, obviously, then receiver-wise, Brian Thomas and Malik Neighbors continue just to light it up. And I, both and I had, yeah, uh, both over 100. Brian Thomas, 124. Malik Neighbors, 102, both with eight catches. It was kind of clear to me that Malik Neighbors was getting bracketed um, with how he, he looked at him, obviously, for eight catches. But Brian Thomas was the one that they were like, all right, this is where we know we have our one-on-ones here. And he threw that thing up to him time and time again. He came down with it. And my my MVP of the game was Mason Taylor, I believe, on offense. And he didn't have a touchdown. But five for 61, that's what we expected from him. And that's why I picked him was because it's pretty clear. Yeah, that I, did you pick, I think you picked Diggs. Oh, did I pick Diggs? You wrote it. So you have a better. I think you picked Diggs, which was a, another great pick. 19 yeah. for 101. Couple yeah, touchdowns. So. Yeah, get to, yeah we can get to all that, but yeah, that the receivers. Um, again, I thought played a very good game, clean game. Uh, Lacey, I believe, had a drop. Um, Hilton had a drop early. I'm not even talking about the the final one, which I, Lacey I, had two big drops. Oh, was it Lacey that too? Then oh, yeah. Um, so I again, I just think it's obvious. Daniels trust Thomas and neighbors and Taylor. Uh, far and away the most. We right should. Now. They're the three best. Yeah, they're the three best pass catchers on the team. It's not close. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not going to be this, like, seven players catching. I think it was seven players, but, you know, it's not going to be seven players with three or four catches. It's going to be those two getting a majority of the, the receptions. Yeah, and Anderson didn't play. They played Chris Hilton, targeted four times. Obviously, he catches the one huge one that went 42 yards yeah. and even put him in position to throw it into the end zone there at the end. Um, and, he look, this is a kid who high jumped seven feet in high school. He got up there. On that last play, Daniel squared up, kind of scrambled around, able to set his feet, throw it, and put it up. You have to put it high for a reason. Jump up there and get it. He out jumps the defenders and it goes right through his hands. And honestly, again, great throw. Yeah, great throw. I'm not trying to pour on Chris Hilton. I'm not trying to because the offense should never have been put in that position. So I'm still sticking with defense here. I'm not going to nitpick any of those guys who play on that side of the ball. No. Uh, run game, obviously. Logan Diggs, man. I what more can you say? Best transfer they got. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Him. He's definitely the best transfer. I mean, he has honestly surpassed, I think, my expectations. And you know how high I was on him coming into the year. I, I expect him to be good. I expect him to be the best running back on this team. And he has taken that to another level with his ability to break tackles, to fight for the hard yards to really to obviously catch passes out of the backfield too. I believe he had two, um, yeah, two for 22 yards. Really smooth as a receiver. They trust him as a pass blocker. Like he has checked off so many boxes that they don't need to play anybody else. And that is a huge, huge win for this offense. I think that gives them another layer that they had did not have. Yeah, they did something tonight that we didn't expect. And look, credit to Mike Denbrock. Um We've said it before on this uh, podcast, as the kids would say, he's been in his bag. And yes. people said, well, we need to see the offense adjust. Yes, it's they're throwing the ball great, but how can they run the football better? Because they did it all against Florida State. And we just thought there would be a rotation all year. They gave Diggs 19 touches tonight for 101. The only other running back who got any carries was Emory. Three, three carries, one of them he took for 14 yards. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, but Caleb Jackson came in, he dropped a wide open pass, but it was Diggs. It was, hey, you're our guy. Let's keep riding you, which is, I think, the right decision. So I, I love what they do on offense. It's just extremely disappointing for LSU fans out there to see that defensively that was the answer. Yeah. Um, last thing I'll say on the offense is, it feels the same as last year as far as how crisp it is and you you understand like the efficiency that they play with i'm really impressed with and then they've just added the obviously the slot fade that they love running with whoever's in the slot they just you know give them the one get the one on one situation there with a safety or a nickel or whatever um but i mean even in general the the ball he threw he had to hilton was was beautiful to start the game and uh those are the type of shots that he wasn't taking last year so you have a balanced offense. You have a dynamic offense where Daniels can throw, can run. Now you have Diggs that can run. You have two, and yes, two elite receivers now. 
Um, Brian Thomas has more than proven that to this point in the year and a reliable tight end. And I mean, this is really, this offense should obviously be one of the best in the country and it is, and it should win you games like this. And that's what makes it uh, disheartening for LSU fans. Yeah. A lot of LSU fans were also arguing that Brian Kelly's out of his mind for not going for it on fourth and seven from his own territory at the end of the game when the result of it was taking a delay of game on purpose and then kicking it to the 12 yard line and giving Ole Miss a minute left in the game. And their thought process because Ole Miss scored was, well, even if you don't get it, then Ole Miss would have scored in less time. In less it's time. a minute. They could have milked the clock and scored like, like that's yeah, and LSU so, only had two tight two timeouts too, I believe, at that point. It didn't it you didn't have to feel, get a stop at some point. And I understand they didn't well, you can say they didn't get any stops all night. That's not true. They actually did get a couple. But yeah. in the end of the game, you with one minute and the ball at the 12 yard line, you have to do something. And they didn't. And that's just the reality of it. And I bet if Brian Kelly could have it back right now, he would do it. Uh, but hindsight's 2020. And for me. His decision there falls below them not being able to stop an offense in yeah. 40 seconds from going 88 yards. Easily, too. God, it was it was. I don't even think they were letting them score. They just they just did. <laughs> like he just ran in and broke two tackles and just scored. And I I was like, oh, that's great. You know, that why is he scoring? And it was like, I don't think they LSU. Yeah, that was a glimmer of hope when they scored. Uh, was it was their there. only shot. It was their only oh, shot. Oh, suddenly, okay. And they can maybe go down with 30 seconds and score, and they really did. Um, okay, big picture. Here's the thing. Brian Kelly's not getting fired um, because a million people are going to be mad, and they're going to be in their uh, drinking tonight and in their emotions and reacting, and I understand it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not being a coach apologist. I'm being a realist here. LSU – went back-to-back -back 500 seasons and a losing season for the first time since 99. That's why they fired Ed Orgeron three years after winning a national championship because the roster was so depleted down to fewer than 40 scholarship players. They were supposed to win six or seven games last year. Someone said on the board tonight, they could have easily lost to Auburn and Arkansas last year. Yeah, they could have, and they would have gone from nine regular season wins to seven, which was the expected. Yeah. This year, you want to see them take a step forward. They're three and two. How do they finish? I don't know. What's clear to me is they did not address defensively the issues that they knew would they would be facing. That's a problem. You hope that doesn't become a recurring problem in recruiting. But when people then want to say, well, what about coaching? That was such a poor performance. It's clearly not worked. Remember this, Maddie, be at Notre Dame. Brian Kelly, beyond like an O-line savant, always beyond Van Gorder, always hit on his DC hires. So if Madhouse doesn't work out, he'll move on from it. You know how I know that? He fired his best friend off this staff. Yep. The guy he's been around the longest and Brian Polian because Brian, special teams was losing them games last year. And because of that, not long into the offseason at all, Brian Polian had taken a new job. It, I do not believe for one second that in year 30-something of Brian Kelly's career, that he is not about to be like loyal to people he hasn't even coached with before. So if we see it and this continues, changes will be made. I have no doubt about that. For the people who are worried that does Brian Kelly not see it type thing. Like if coaching's your issue and it truly is, like if that's the answer, Brian Kelly will fire those people. He literally did it in year yeah. one to the person he was closest with on the staff. Yeah. And there's no point in obviously that they're not going to fire house midseason. I mean, you, you have enough coaching issues, right? I mean, you have enough coaching turnover, defensive line, obviously, Bob Diaco going to coach Jack. Like, there's so much, like, that is something we haven't uh, probably haven't there's talked about. There's a lot about. going on on defense. Jesus. Like, yeah, there's probably, we haven't talked about it enough. Like, the shakeup on the defensive line, coaching wise, Jack uh, position, obviously, Greg Brooks being out. Like, the, the, stuff that the defense has gone through over the past, you know, few months has not been ideal. And so there's no firing Matt house week four season. Now, I mean, I, who knows, but obviously, like you said, if this continues and they allow 500 yards to Missouri and Florida and whoever else, yes, they're going to be changes made like this. This isn't, this isn't groundbreaking stuff. So everybody, yes, get it all out, you know, say we want so-and-so fired, so-and-so fired. Sure. Um, Ultimately, 
your shots of winning the SEC West, your chances of winning the SEC West have decreased significantly. Like if we went into this game and even just said they had a 25% chance, let's just say of winning the SEC West, I'm probably down to like 5%, 10% at this point. Well, it's just, it's deflating because it seemed wide open. Yes. It felt wide open. So that's the thing is it feels wide open and sure. It actually, maybe it could be, you know, maybe Alabama drops some games. It shouldn't and AM and drops some games. It shouldn't. And maybe the, the SEC West champ like last year ends up going six and two. And it's LSU who has a six and two record with a win over Bama. Like it's on it the team. Doesn't appear that good, it, but it doesn't appear like, yeah, it doesn't appear like nobody in this com- in this division feels overpowering, and that's why it hurts to lose to Ole Miss. And that's what made – I tweeted this out. I said after watching Arkansas A&M and um, the Georgia game, like I'm like – and I know Georgia's in the East, but I'm like this SEC is, is wide open, man. And for LSU to lose this game, and obviously that I was looking at this game as a win – Missouri pr- probably a win, Auburn probably a win, and Army probably win. Like I'm, I through my purple and gold lenses, I was like, "There's a shot. They're seven and one going to Bama." And now it's like, "All right, now you got to beat Missouri. Now you got to beat Georgia." And that's it's not not be Georgia. As, I'm sorry, uh, Auburn. Yeah, Auburn, Missouri, Auburn, and Army. They could still be six and two going into Bama. Sure. I just think now we all know the reality that six and two. That's your record, but you're not that good of a team. And now not you defensively. Have, yeah, and now you have Bama. Like again, you have Bama and, and A and M to end the season. You have to win, obviously, at least one of those, in theory. And depending on how good Alabama is, you might have to win both of them. So, and I mean, hey, A and M could be really good too. I don't know, but uh, yes, this is obviously a blow for the SEC West. But if they beat Missouri, let's let's end on a positive note. If they beat Missouri, if they beat Auburn, if they beat Army, they're six and two. Florida still does not look good. Georgia State does not look good. Like, there's eight wins right there. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Don't shoot the messenger, well, but I'm saying there's eight games. Like, those are games where LSU will be a touchdown favorite, I guess. I don't know about Missouri's spread coming up, but I'm just saying, like, that would get them to eight and potentially eight and four if you lose to Bama and A&M. That's yeah, I'll thinking. say this, too. And, look, people tonight, we run uh, the Bengal Tiger, the message board's on fire, and – It'll be like that on all message boards and Twitter and call-in shows of LSU's never going to win under Brian Kelly. They don't recruit well enough. That's for that conversation right there is for another day. All of these different things. The reality of it is for this season in year two, after a month, I can confidently say if you have a good offense, you'll score on LSU. Even if you have a good defense, LSU scoring on you. Yeah. So that's what these games are coming down. Like I don't see a point where LSU goes rolls out and scores 10 points in a game or something. Like they were doing that last year. They scored 13 and beat Arkansas last year. That ain't happening this year. This offense is elite elite. Yeah. They're, They're not going to be slowed down or stopped even when they face a really good defense. They will put up more than 30 points on everybody they play. I'm beating a dead horse here. What stings is if you play a upper tier offense in the SEC, they're also going to put up points on you because you have proven nothing this so far defensively that you can stop teams that are good on offense. Grambling at a hundred yard rusher on LSU. Yeah. And I don't want people to think that I'm looking at an eight and four seat, like potential eight and four season as being a good thing. I'm I'm not. But I'm saying those are the wins, and if you can steal one against Bama or and M S nine wins, which is where we were with all the fans after they lost to Florida State. Everybody was like, oh, it's an eight-win season, all this stuff. Well, then it got good, then it got bad. Everything, maybe this team is a nine-win team, and I think that's kind of out – like this isn't – like they might win an SEC West championship. Who knows? Maybe there's still a chance, but this doesn't feel like it should be playing in Atlanta. So yeah. that's and we'll talk it. more. I think everyone's caught in the moment tonight because you should be. You should never again, never ever ever lose a game where you're putting up such a brilliant performance on offense and you allow seven hundred something yards and fifty five points on defense. That's yeah. so bad, and you can't write it off in any sort of way to make yourself feel good about it. The whole like, what does it mean for the program trajectory? I think would be a conversation for way down the road because right now they just are what they are. They don't have 
whether it's youth and inexperience and having to learn the run or whether it's veterans who are not the standard LSU, they're not good enough personnel wise. If you then want to stay coaching, you don't trust. Well, that just magnifies it. And then in your mind would make it worse and perhaps in reality, make it worse. So, uh, or put them at, uh, even more of a disadvantage instead of an advantage, uh, coaching up guys who may not be up to par and then they play better than maybe they were expected to. It doesn't matter how you slice it. It's very clear right now that the results are they're not good enough on defense. What does that mean for the rest of this season? We'll see. It. I think we're in for a lot of shootouts uh, after what we've seen the last two weeks. Yep. Nothing else? No, sorry, folks, you cut out. You cut out for uh, a no. second. I know, I know folks are upset. Um, I would be too as an LSU fan, but – We'll see. Year two of the Brian Kelly era continues. And uh, after another opening season loss, um, they had kind of course corrected a little bit. And then, boy, tonight does not feel good uh, to walk out of there on a night where you played well enough to win on one side of the ball, but just played so bad on the other. Yeah, drastic um, difference on both sides of the ball, or on one side of the ball to the other. All right, that's it. Uh, 35 minutes. Um, we hope you all enjoyed it. And, I mean, even if you didn't enjoy it, at least listen to us ramble about LSU football. And uh, we'll be back. We'll be back with the mailbag on Monday, which I'm sure will be very tamed and understanding about the situation. Um, but, yeah, Monday mailbag, uh, Tuesday recruiting, all that stuff will be out throughout the week. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us. Thank you for supporting us. I think we're almost at 4K subs. I don't remember where we're at. But thank you all for watching, subscribing, liking the videos. We really appreciate it. Subscribe to the Bengal Tiger if you have not already. And we will talk to you all later.